we'll start with the prayers om bhadram karane de shruniyama deva bhadram pashye maksha bhirya jatra stirai rangai hi sushtu vagum sashtanu bihi vyashema deva hi tam yadayu swastina indro vritta shravaha swastina indro vritta shravaha swastina pusha vishva vedaha swastina stakshora rishtane mihi swastino brihaspatir tadato om shanti 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 hi We are studying Mandukya Upanishad by Shankara Bhashyam, the first chapter called as Agama Prakaranam. We have finished the mantras 1 to 6. We are now entering into Gaudapada's Karikas, the commentary of Gaudapada Acharya, the author of these karikas, this commentary is written by Shankaracharya's great grand guru. So he has written a commentary on the Mandukya Upanishad of the first six verses. That is what we are covering now. After this, we will have the seventh mantra. So there are about nine anu, uh, nine karikas, which karikas means verses. So nine karikas, it, uh, in Mandukya, verse is called as karika. So I will use the term karika. So there are nine karikas, which explain the verses from one to six. The author Gaudapadacharya, in the very first karika, which we are going to do today, describes the entire Mandukya Upanishad in the seed form. The whole Upanishad, the essence of the whole Upanishad, he covers in one verse. See, that is the beauty of the teacher. He explains to us the whole philosophy behind the Mandukya Upanishad. So today's session is a very important session. Try to understand every single word which I'm saying because this is the gist of the entire Upanishad. Shankaracharya's Bhashyam is also great. And uh, let's go back to where we stopped last week with slide number 312. Here what Shankaracharya says is that the Bahish Pragna, Anta Pragna, Bahish Pragna, Pragnana Ghanam, these are the states of one pure consciousness. Very important point to understand. If you understand this point, then you, you all your doubts will get solved because of this basic understanding. So what does it mean? There is one eternal, changeless consciousness, which is appearing and that is Shuddha, pure. Whenever we say pure, it means Shuddha. Shuddha means it doesn't have any Sanchita Karma. Jiva has Sanchita Karma. Wrongly understood Jiva has got Sanchita Karma. Correctly understood Jiva does not have Sanchita Karma. This Atma is not related to the three states. Try to understand this. These are all, you know, in a very cryptic fashion, Shankaracharya has packed the whole knowledge of Vedanta 
in these sentences. So this Atma, when I say this Atma, it is my Atma. My Atma is not related to the three states because the three states belong to the mind. Body and mind are a product of Pancha Bhutas and the Sanchita Karmas. There is a law which governs the body and the mind and the actions. This is what we learn in the Bhagavad Gita also. Now, another point he says is the three states are incidental. See this paragraph, it has got a lot of inner meaning in it. Atma is eternal. The three avastas are incidental. Now, this Atma goes through the three states. At the same time, it can remain away from the three states. That is what is being said here. Now, how do we know this Atma? What is the, what is the method of knowing that there exists some Atma which is not changing at all? Here Shankaracharya says that our memory is the proof. I am that Atma which was there in the dream, in the waking and in the sleep. This memory is called as Pratyabhijna, recognition. When I wake up in the morning, all of us, we say we dreamt. When we say we dreamt and we say we slept, it means there was some I which was not changing throughout the sleep state. It was not changing when the mind was going through the dream. And it doesn't change even in waking when I am experiencing the waking state. This is the idea which is given in Brahadhanik Upanishad, which I will quote, which I will present after in a few slides from now. So, Gaudapadacharya is making a general remark about what is the essence behind verses 3 to 6. If you recall, third mantra, of the Upanishad deals with waking. Fourth mantra deals with dream. Fifth and the sixth mantra deals with sleep. That is what he is summarizing here. Prathama Pada, the first Pada is Bahish Pragnyaha Bhavati. This first Pada, the individual Jiva, he is given a name, Vishwa. Vishwa is a name. See, we are giving six names totally. The first pair is Vishwa and Virat. These two are attached to the waking state. Vishwa is the individual, Vyashti. Virat is the total, Samashti, the all-pervading. That is, also, that is also a part of Ishvara. Ishvara will be defined in the third verse, in the fifth and the sixth verse. But the physical aspect of Ishvara is the Virat. That is why we say it is Vishwarupa Ishvara, which is Virat. Prathama Pada Bhavati. The first Pada is the Vishwa and Virat. What is the second pada? The second pada is Taijasa and Hiranyagarbha. See, try to be, become familiar with these six names because these six names will be used throughout Mandukya study. The second state is the dream state. And the dream, the dreamer is shining. We all experience it. In, see, we, in our experience of dream, what is our condition? There is a world. 
in which there is some illumination. That is why it is called as Tejo Mayaha. Anta Pragna. Anta Pragna means what? The awareness consciousness is turned within. In the waking state, the awareness is turned outside. Awareness is neither outside or inside. But whenever the physical body is present, we say that awareness is turned outside. When the subtle body is there, mind alone is there, we say it is internal. Antakkarna vritti rupatvat taijasaha. And this taijasa is non different from Hiranyagarbha because they are a pair. Like the Virat and the Vishwa are a pair. They go together. They always exist together. Whenever you are in dream, you will see this, two, this pair. Taijasa and Hiranyagarbha. Vishwa, Virat in the waking. This is the second pada. What is the third pada? Ghana Pragnyaha. Ghana Pragnya means undifferentiated consciousness. Same awareness, same consciousness, when it does not look outside or inside, it is called as ganaha. Ganaha means heavy. Heavy and what is the second aspect feature? It is undifferentiated. So there is a condition of mind every day which I experience, in which I experience no world, I don't experience my body. I am neither a male or a female in my sleep state. I am neither a rich person or a poor person in the sleep state. I am neither an intelligent or a dull person in the sleep state. All these conditions belong to the jiva when he recognizes the physical body. But in the sleep state, I am Pragyana Ghanaha. The most important thing you should understand is the function of the mind is completely dormant in the sleep. What is the function of a mind? It, the, fun, the mind divides itself into three parts. Pramatru, Pramana and Prameyam. Prameyam means the objects which it sees. External objects and the body. Pramanam means the mind itself is the instrument. Pramatru means it is the pramata, the subject. That means the mind, because of its nature, gets divided into knower, known, knowing, instrument, all this comes in differentiated form in the waking state. But in the sleep state, these three things are not there. They all become one. See how deep this entire world of consciousness is. How beautifully our scriptures analyze the world. This is completely a different darshana. It is a vision given by the Veda, which you can never get anywhere else. What we are studying is a very divine nature of the world. That is why we are we call this in the chapter 11 of the Gita, Vishwarupa Ishwaraha. It is Ishwara. The world is nothing but Ishwara. It is God in a different form. In the sleep state, God is in a different form. It is in unmanifest condition. So the Pragyanam is a Tritiya Pada. So this much we all understand is very, very easy, very clear. Then Shankaracharya, uh, 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 Gaudapada Acharya and Shankaracharya, they give us a gist of the seventh mantra in the karika number one itself. This is an addition. 
of of gauda padacharya because he can't keep that knowledge within himself he has to introduce turiya he has to introduce that chaitanya his his mind is bubbling with joy with, with and he wants to express the seventh mantra in the very first karik so what he says is the three padas are not three padas they all belong to one atma that atma is chaitanya swarupam chaitanya reveals itself as the waker itself as the weak, uh, dreamer itself as the sleeper with three different worlds world of plurality in the waking state and the dream state world of non differentiation of object subject and instrument in the sleep state these are three conditions of the mind instrument of the jiva this is a very important point which we must understand when we are trying to understand who we are normally we make a mistake i am going to cover this in our meditation session today because this topic comes in the meditation uh, 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 verse which we will do what is the mistake we commit we commit the mistake that body is me mind is me we have to neighborize our mind neighborize our body like we have a neighbor at home it is the, whatever happens to a neighbor doesn't affect me so similarly we have to learn to neighborize our body and mind from us from me the consciousness sunlight is one but the objects which are revealed are many so similarly consciousness awareness is one the jivas because of the upadis they appear to be many jiva what is this lesson we learn from the upanishad jiva is eternal jiva is not the body and mind jiva is atma jiva is turiyam the fourth pada so turiyam is not introduced so far by the upanishad but kauda paja acharya can control his mind he writes on it in this karika number 1 first verse of the commentary what does he say here he says that the one consciousness it wears three hats it masquerades as the waker i am the waker all of us we say i am the waker in the waking state i am the dreamer in the dream state i am the sleeper in the sleep state it is a spiritual light of turiyam what is this what is turiyam consist of it is a light of awareness very unique very it that is why it is called as the divine light what light which we are used to in the external world is the physical light it is not the spiritual light it is the material light now the physical light cannot illumine the thoughts in our mind but the spiritual light illumines the thoughts in our mind it illumines the emotions in our mind your anger your uh, love your jealousy your desires all these are illumined by what light it is the spiritual light of atma upadis means mediums this word is also very very important body is a medium for that spiritual light it appears to have three different roles of waker dreamer sleeper for example this is a very uh, a very uh, prominent example given in the scriptures soyam devadatta saha 
This Devadatta, Devadatta is the name of a person. Devadatta, this person you are seeing in front is the same person whom you have met 25 years ago. Soyam Saha. Soyam means the person now with a white hair, he is older, who is fat, is the same person whom you have met 25 years ago with a black hair, he was very, very slim and he was a younger person. Superficially, they are, you cannot say they are the same person. They are mutually exclusive, superficially. But then how, how do you put this equation that it is the same person you are seeing now? What you have to do is, equation is made by Pratyapigna. The word Pratyapigna is a Sanskrit word, it's a technical word for recognition, recollection. What we do is, we apply Bhaga Tyaga Lakshana, which we do for Mahavakyas. What we, what we, how do we do the Bhagataga Lakshana? This is a, this is, this example will help you to understand how I should remove the incidental features and hold on to the intrinsic feature. What is the incidental feature for all of us? The body, the mind, the three avastas, pancha koshas, the three bodies, they are all incident. Compared to what? My intrinsic nature, which is consciousness. Chaitanya Surupa. This is how we have to understand this entire spiritual science. So Jiva has got a direct definition which is called as Vachyata, which is Laukika, which is worldly. Then there is an indirect definition of a Jiva, which is called as Lakshyata. Indicative, it's an, Lakshyata means it is an indicator. When you look at a Jiva, any person you meet in the world, that Jiva can be looked at in two ways. You can look at the physical features and say he is, he, uh, she is a female, I am a male. And look, these are all incidental. When you look at the Vachyata, that is the, the, what is the direct meaning, it is called as Adhyaropa. This is again a technical. Adhyaropa means superimposition. But suppose in my mind, I don't look at that person as a physical person or a mental person with a mind, with passion, emotions. But I look at the person as a spiritual essence, awareness, which the Upanishad is, who is, which the Upanishad is teaching us, that we are all awareness principle. We are only consciousness principle, but we are appearing with a body in our waking state. But this body, physical body is not available in the dream state. It is not available in the sleep state. So what we do, what we do is we drop our eye from the three bodies. When we identify with the three bodies, we are waker, dreamer, sleeper. Without the identification of the three bodies, who are we? Are we existing or not? Yes. We, suppose you say that I, I can exist without the body and this is the pramana. Upanishad is the pramana. To say that I exist without the body and mind. In what form do you exist? You, ex, you exist in the Turiya form. In the Lakshyartha. Whatever it is, you drop the three, you drop three avastas, drop uh, five koshas, whatever you are, that you assume is your real nature. 
So Shankaracharya says, Pratya Vigna and Bhaga Tyaga Lakshana reveals our intrinsic nature of Turiyam. Recognition of our actual Swarupam, which never changes. What changes? The, the body and mind changes in the waking state, in the dream state, in the sleep state. But what is changeless is the Turiya, pure consciousness. So in one, we can say that I am the consciousness behind all the three avastas. I am the consciousness be behind all the pancha koshas. Because most of you are also doing Taitri Upanishad on Saturdays with me. This lesson of Mandukya about Turiyan is the same what we have done yesterday in Taitri Upanishad, where we call Turiyam as Brahman. When we, when we drop all the five koshas and the Anandamaya kosha also, where do you land? You land in same Brahman. In, in Taitri Upanishad, it is called as Brahman. In Mandokya Upanishad, it is called as Turiyam. In Bhagavad Gita, it is called as Uttama Purushaha. In Chandogya Upanishad, it is called as Bhuma. Reality is one, but the names which are given are different according to the context. So, Shuddhatvam Siddham. Shuddhatvam Siddham means what? It means that the properties which I am now holding on to myself actually depends, it is the property of the body. Father, son belongs to the waker eye. In the dreamer eye, you, you as the father of your son in the waking state is not there. You as the mother, in the dream state, you are not there. In the sleep state, completely not there. So all problems, samsara which we are saying, belongs to the vesha, belongs to the wakerhood, dreamerhood and sleeper. See how deep we are studying this verse. This is a very beautiful verse. The first karika. Try to revise this karika. You will, you will hold on to the essence of the entire Mandokya Upanishad. If you understand this one verse. Because this is the way to understand Upanishads. The problems belong to the waker when he is identified as the physical body. The problems belong to the dreamer eye or to the sleeper eye. Baker, dreamer, sleeper are incidental. This is a very important teaching. It is not an eternal thing. I am in the waking state is not an eternal thing. It will change when you go to sleep. But what is eternal? Eternal is I am Turiyam. I am Atma without the three bodies and the Prapancha, the universe. This is the single most teaching which you should keep in your mind throughout your life. This is what is called as Moksha. So Shuddhatvam of Atma is established by the Upanishad. Then it brings in the seventh mantra, which is Turiyam. And then the features of Turiyam is, it is Asangaha. Asangaha means it is not at all connected. It is relationless. But what, what about the relationship which I am making with my waking state, with this body? It is an incidental relationship. It is not an intrinsic relationship. It is not a permanent relationship. Baker, dreamer, sleeper is not my real nature. This is the most important 
lesson we learn from Mandukya. In Taitriya, we, we learn what? We learn that the Pancha Koshas is not me. Here we are saying the three avastas are not me. That is how you have to connect both these Upanishads. Pancha Koshas are incidental. The three avastas are incidental. Relationships are only incidental. They are related. They are not absolute. This is the knowledge which I have to hold on. In Brahadana Upanishad, this is the mantra which is quoted by Shankaracharya in this first paragraph where he uses this particular verse. And he is here he talks about that consciousness which is available in the waking state in a location which is called the right eye. The location will come in the next mantra. In the second karika, Gaudapada Acharya will mention about the location of consciousness in all the three states. But here Shankaracharya just introduces us to that. And he also introduces us to this mantra in the Brahadhanik Upanishad, which talks about an example. What is the example Shankaracharya uses? Maha Matsyadi Drishtanta. This comes in Brahadhanik Upanishad. What is this example? In this example, let me try to explain to you. See, uh, when we study the Bhashyam, one verse of the Upanishad will run into several 40, 50 slides. The second mantra, the second karika runs into maybe a hundred slides. So this is the way, this is the deep way of studying the Upanishad, especially Mandukya. It is only 12 mantras. But the commentary of Gaudapada Acharya and Shankaracharya runs into hundreds of pages. If you see my notes, the first chapter itself will be a thousand odd pages. We are in the th 321 slide now. First chapter itself runs, I'm, I don't remember how much, how much uh, uh, is the first chapter, but if you see the website, you'll find that. Now, let's come to this example of a whale. Now, a whale or a big fish, it moves in the Brahmaputra River, which is 14 kilometers wide. The fish is in the center. On the left side and on the right side, there is a shore. On the right side, this is an example. On the right side, we say it is waking. On the left side, we say it is dream. There are events happening on the shore. There are events happening on the right side as well as the left side. But in the center, there are no events. The center is called as the sleep state. The big fish moves from right to left from waking to sleep, uh, waking to dream, the jiva moves. The big fish is not influenced by the current of the river. The small fish is determined, uh, is affected by the current of the river. What is the difference between the small fish and the big fish? Small fish is the agyani fish. Big fish is what is the jnani fish. So, as a jnani, if you know that you are not affected by the events of the shore, but you are the witness sakshi. That is what we have to learn from this example. As sakshi, consciousness, awareness, I am not at all affected by the jagratavastha or the sopnavastha. Why? Because these problems are all dropped in the sleep state. 
That is what is Shankaracharya's point here. Anavagatam punyena, anavagatam papena. That means punyam and papam, they are incidental. Mata na mata, pita apitaha, bhavati. You are not a mother, you are not a father, you are not a son, you are not a daughter in the sleep state. Sarvalokan Ridasyasya Bhavati. All the worlds ultimately get resolved in the Atma. So, the gunas affect the body and the mind. I am Gunatita Atma. That is what Shankaracharya wants to explain for that first verse in the first karik. Kathopanishad, he brings this Kathopanishad also. Anyatra dharma, anyatra dharma, anyatra smat krita krita akya, anyatra bhuta cha bhavya cha yat tat pashyati tat vada. This is a brilliant question of the seeker in Kathopanishad. In Kathopanishad, the seeker, a 12-year-old boy, he goes to the Yamadharma Raja, the Lord of Death, and asks this question. What is that which is beyond virtue and vice, beyond sin and uh, merit? What is beyond right and unright? Right and wrong. What is beyond, when he talks about this, it means what is beyond cause and effect. Is there something beyond cause and effect? I am the cause of my children. I am the effect of my parents. That is what we see in this Jagrata Vasta. But is there anything which I'm missing? Is there a consciousness which is always there, which is beyond the cause and effect? Past and future. Past is the cause. Future is always the effect. So again, the student is asking the teacher the same thing. Is there anything beyond cause and effect? Is there anything which is beyond what I see in the world as cause and effect. Why this mantra is brought about, it is to hammer the point to us that there exists the Turi Atma, which is what is revealed in the Kathopanishad as Najayate Brete Va Kadachit. Kadachit, here it, they, we use the word Vipaschit. Nayam Kutaschane. This is the same verse which is which you find with a small modification in the 20th verse of the second chapter. But also verse is in talking about the seventh mantra of Mandukya, same thing. See, all these mantras, why we are bringing up different, different Upanishad, Bhagavad Gita, Purusha Suktam, all this is because all of them, the entire scriptural knowledge is revealing to us that I am not the mortal body mind. If you can understand this one point, which is what we are going to learn in today's uh, Bhagavad Gita's uh, meditations. Okay, so uh, this is the verse which talks about the fish in Brahadanika Upanishad. Chapter 4, third section, 18th section, uh, 18th verse. So the infinite being moves between these states, the dream and the waking state. Bradhanik Upanishad also gives another example. One is the fish example and the show. The second example is the birds and the nest. Like a bird which flies throughout the waking state, 
to different parts and enjoys that world, like we also as jivas, we enjoy the world of Jagran. But all of us, we return to our nest when we go to sleep. We go and rest in our Atma. That is a second example. In the Atma, there are no desires. There is no relationship. We are Asanga Swarupaha. So with this, we complete the first Karika of the Mantras. Mantras 3 to 6, there are 9 Karikas, 9 verses. We have finished the first one. What is the first one saying? Vishwa, Taijasa and Pragna. They are all nothing but one consciousness in three different forms. According to the Upadi of the mind. Try to understand this. You see, the mind is the most important factor in our, in our body-mind complex. Mind, not the physical body. The mind has got a tremendous value. It is through the mind we experience bondage. It is through the mind we experience liberation. Therefore, mind, understanding what the mind is, capable of is very important when we are a seeker. And these verses of Mandokya help us to understand the nature of the mind and also the nature of consciousness which lies behind the mind. That consciousness is the Turiyam which I have to claim. See, all these sessions, all these sessions on Mandokya are all based only for one purpose. What is that purpose? Today, I have a notion that I am the body and mind. And it is mortal. It has got death. It has got birth. Upanishad wants to change that notion of mind. It is a wrong notion which I have been having. I have to remove this notion. How do I remove this? Upanishad introduces Turiyam. It introduces Atma. It introduces Brahman. And says that you are that Atma which is eternal which has got no birth and no death. Till you are able to understand this fundamental teaching of the Upanishads, you must continue the learning. Continue to be a seeker. Okay? So very beautiful verse of, uh, of, uh, the, of the first month, uh, Karika, the commentary of uh, Gaudapada Acharya on the three, three, four, five, six, four verses. On four verses are nine verses commentary written by Gaudapada Acharya. Now, next we are going to study the second karika. Totally there are nine which are explaining. Um, I have compiled some notes, I have written some notes on the entire first chapter in a capsule form in about 60 pages. The entire first chapter, Agama Prakaranam, I thought that one needs to have a bird's eye view of this whole chapter. I'm going to circulate that notes. If you're interested, you let me know. I will send it to you. This will be circulated to only those people who are interested, who are very, very deeply interested to study the first chapter in a bird's eye view point. So that you get to know how the whole teaching progresses in the first chapter. 
the first chapter, there are 12 mantras of the Upanishad and 29 karikas. You can, you can study either step by step, like how we are doing in these sessions, or you can just get a glimpse of the whole picture. Because this first chapter is the most important chapter in the entire four chapters. If you understand the first chapter correctly, then you will have a desire to learn the second and the third and the fourth. It is a very beautiful uh, teaching, very, very systematic teaching in Mandokya, which you find, which you don't find in any other Upanishad. It is, it's a brilliant Upanishad because of the very practicality of it. See, it makes us think who we are in a very deep way. Okay, coming back here, the second sloka is intended to show that the waking state, the dream state, and the sleep state, where are they located? See, normally, when some we want to understand something and we want to meditate, Whenever we want to meditate on something, it will be easy if I can put a location to it. For the purpose of meditation, upasana, the location has been given by Gaudapada Charya. That is what Shankaracharya says in this paragraph. So what is the purpose of the second shloka? The purpose of the second karika is to give three locations for the sake of meditation. What are the three locations? Vishwa is in the right eye. Taijasa is in the left eye. Pragna is in the Hridaya Akasha. Sorry, there should be, uh, 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 th there is a mistake here. Taijasa, it is not the left eye, it should be the mind. Okay, I will correct it. So, Taijasa is in the mind, Vishwa is in the right eye, and Pragna is in the heart. These are the three locations. Vekar, now, for the Vekar, he is all over the body. But, Temporarily, for the sake of meditation, we see it in the right eye. Similarly, for the sake of meditation, we see the taijasa in our mind and prajna in the heart. Waker, dreamer and sleeper, they appear to be totally different because of their world. But once we use the common aspect of these three states, which doesn't change, which we use the Pratyabhijna logic, then we are able to understand that there is a uniform, unchanging Turiya. This is the proposition, this is the aim of this shloka in the waking state itself, we can play the three roles of the waker, dreamer, and the sleep. So there are, there are two aspects of this sloka. One is to give the location. The second aspect is Gaudapada Acharya will tell us how we can experience in the waking state itself all the three states. There is a methodology he will teach us. Vishwa works from the right eye. This is the next paragraph, 68th paragraph of Shankaracharya's Bhashyam. I have named, I have put a number to all the Bhashyam paragraphs. Normally, you don't see these things, but for the sake of teaching, I have put those mantras, uh, the karikas, uh, 
with some serial number so that it helps us. Okay, now this verse, uh, Vijaya will chant and then let's hear how this second karika is chanted. Dakshina Akshi Mukhe Vishwaha Dakshina Akshi Mukhe Vishwaha Manasyantastu Tejasaha Manasyantastu Tejasaha Akashe Chakridi Pragyaha Akashe Chakridi Pragyaha Tridha Dehe Vyabastitaha Tridha Dehe Vyabastitaha so what the what Gaudapada Charya says in this commentary verse is he says that there is one Atma which works from three headquarters as three different entities. And the location is the right eye. Mind and heart. Dakshina. Vishwa is in the right eye, Taijasa is in the mind, and Pragna is in the space within the heart. The gist of the Bhashyam is as follows. While, why do we say right eye? That is the question which Shankaracharya asks. He says, Normally, the right eye for all of us is the most powerful compared to the left. The southern direction is the Dakshina. Dakshina, that means the south direction. For all karmas, we face the east. While facing the east, the right side happens to be the south. Opening of the right eye is important for the Vishwa. For the sake of Upasana, the, the, um, the waker is imagined that he is in the right eye. This is only for people who want to meditate on the three states. This is an aid and uh, 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 this is something which the commentator Gaudapadacharya has provided us. And he says that the chakshu is the most important organ for a waker. See, suppose you are not able to see the world. We have five sense organs, but amongst the five sense organs, which is the most important, Gaudapada Acharya and Shankara Acharya says it is the eye. Therefore, eye is taken up as a representative location for the waker. Then, for the dreamer, the mind is very important. When you close the eyes and you want to recollect something, and you want to imagine something, then what you are doing, you are focusing on the mind. So even in the waking state itself, you suppose you just close your eyes, which we normally do in our meditation, and you start thinking about something, deliberately thinking. So visually, visualizing mentally is always like a dream. Even in dream, what you are doing, you are only throwing up all the vasanas which you have generated, which is there from the causal body, you bring it to the subtle body and you see. But what he is saying is, even when you are in the waking state, waking state, Vishwa is on the right eye is very easy to understand. What he is now saying is, when you close your eyes, the mind projects that is it's very similar to what we experience in the dream state therefore the dream state is meditated on the mind location of the dream state is the mind 
I mean, these are all small factors which comes up in the commentary. In the Vishnu Sahasnama Dhyana Shloka, Shantakaram, Bhujagashayanam, Padvanamam, Suresham, this particular verse. Here also, the, the, the meditation on Lord Vishnu is in the mind. So even while sitting, and suppose you are sitting in the baking state, you are imagining this Lord in your own mind. That is what is called as the dream state. It is in the baking state itself, you can get the dream state experience also. What about the sleep state? Suppose you are able to withdraw your sense organs and the mind in samadhi state. Then what? It is as good as sleep state. So what Gaudapada Acharya is saying? During the waking state itself, when the mind is tired and you don't see and you don't visualize, you observe the mental silence. At that time, you are prajna. Absence of external world, sense organs are closed, no external world. If the external world is there, you are awake. If there is no external world, only the internal world, then you are a dreamer. If both the things are not there, it's a blackout. That is what is called as prat. Sometimes, suppose an elephant comes right in front of your house, and then you are get you get completely stunted. That time also, your mind is not functioning, your eyes are seeing something and you are stunted. It is a blank state. It is like the sleep state. So, Gaudapada Acharya says, even in waking state itself, you can have the experience of all the three states. Therefore, there is only one Turiyam, one experience or consciousness, Chaitanyam, which is called as Sakshi, which is there as the support of the three states. It is not the three states. That is why we are going to negate the three states in the seventh month. Okay? All right. So this is a brief explanation of the second karika. This, I, I have got some revision slides here. Whatever I have not said, I will just uh, discuss that. Whatever I have said, I won't go through it. So these karikas which we are studying are all from verses 1 to 6, summary, summarized by Gaudapada Acharya. The three states I have discussed, this Pratyabhijna method, self-recognition method, in which we equate all the three states as one perception. Uh, that is what is called as Pratyabhijna, which, which we have discussed. The first time cognition is not, is called as perception, where the object is in front. But second time, when I'm thinking of that person who, who I, I had met yesterday, that is what is called as recollection. What Gaudapada Acharya is saying is, this recollection is possible only if there was a Sakshi present behind the vehicle. The same Sakshi is saying, I saw that person yesterday. I am now remembering that person. So, memory is a proof of the existence of Sakshi. Very, very, very deep, very deep uh, analysis of Shankaracharya. When you see Devadatta second time, it is called as recognition. So, re second time is a remembrance. I saw the same person before. Second time cognition is a perception, is a mixture of perception and past memory. Because you recollect, ah, this is the same. These are the features. This is what he told me yesterday. All that thing comes into your memory. So, Pratyabhijna is the pramanam to say that there is a continuity of a of some person when I have not seen that person. 
that Devadatta is still surviving. Same concept, you use it in our three states. There is some Sakshi, some self, some Atma, I, which was there in the sleep state, which was there in the dream state, which is there even now in the waking state. That common I is called as Turiyam I. See how beautifully Shankaracharya introduces Turiyam. Turiyam is the continuous I, which never changes. When I identify the physical body, it is the waking state. When I identify with the mental body, it is the dream state. When I identify with the ignorance, when I don't see anything, it is the causal body. But in all these three, there is one common Sakshi, which is different from the waker, dreamer and sleeper. But it also is there along with the, different, along with the waker, dreamer and sleeper. The principle when it is with the waker, dreamer, sleeper, it is called as immanent in English. In, when it is taken up separately, it is different than the waker and dream, uh, dreamer, sleeper when we say that it is a transcendent principle. See, in the, these karikas are very deep. And when you study these karikas, you can reach that Turiyam Atma very easily. So Pratyabhignya is a Pramanam, is a source of knowledge to reveal the continuous I, which is inherent in Vishwa Daijasa Pragna, but which is also different from Vishwa Daijasa Pragna. See, can you, you can understand this statement. The Sakshi I is the one which I always refer as I. Indirectly, I am referring to it only. That is why I always say I never change. I have never changed in the last 40 years. When somebody says this, he is referring to the Turiyam. My body has changed. My mind has changed. My uh, intellect has changed. These are all the incidental I. Okay. Now, in the second karika, when he introduces this, the three realms which make why why do we why we don't recognize this turiyam? That is what Shankaracharya says. He says it is because of the prapancha, because we are attached to our desires, attached to our raga and dvesha in the world. Therefore, we are not able to clearly identify this Turiyam. This Turiyam itself puts the three Veshams. Veshams means uh, uh, th three rows. Because of the Upadis. It is one Atma which experiences three different aspects of our mind. These are all the revision portion. That's why I'm going a little faster. I've already discussed all this. <laughs> okay. Now coming back to this, uh, the, uh, this also I have discussed. Uh, that Brahadhanik Upanishad, four, chapter 4.2.2, Indro Vainama. This also I have discussed before. And the right eye, I have discussed these aspects. Uh, okay. Aikyam, when we say, Aikyam means oneness. Oneness is only when we are talking of the Chaitanya level. Okay? At the Chaitanya level, at the Turiyam level, there is oneness. But at the three Pada levels, there is no oneness. It is different. Okay. Now, there is a debate. There is a questionnaire, a puro pakshi. This is how the style of uh, uh, the, uh, the Bhashyam is written. So Shankaracharya tries to imagine a person 
who's, who is not understanding the Turiya, but he only knows about the, the physical body and the universe. So he's asking a doubt here so that it, so that you see, even when we, uh, when we are trying to understand this Turiyam, for those who understand the Turiyam, this doubt will not come. But for other people, for Agyanis, they will have this doubt. What is this doubt? Is not the Virat Atma different than the Vishwa? The question is, how can you equate the micro Vishwa with the macro Virat? Vishwa is what? He is seeing, uh, Vishwa is the person who is the Shetraknya, who is the Baker eye. He is seeing only a small portion of the eye, a small, small portion of the world. Virat Atma is what? It's a Paramatma who is seeing the entire universe. Now here, Shankaracharya is asking, how come you are equating the two? The answer to that question is, we are not equating the two at the physical Virat level. At the consciousness level only, we are equating. At the Virat level, at the, at the Vyavahara level, we are different. That is what he wants to say the, uh, uh, as an answer to this question. So, Try to understand the question first. Vishwa is different than Virat. There is no IKM possible. There is no oneness possible between Vishwa and Virat at a superficial level. That is what Shankaracharya is saying. Differences are there at the superficial level. But what differences you see is not intrinsic. For example, Akasha is one. Gata Akasha and Maha Akasha. Gata Akasha is a small space. Stadium Akasha is a slightly bigger space. Maha Akasha is the biggest space. So what, what makes the difference? The difference is made because of the Upadi. Because of the body. Space contained in a small pot. Space contained in a small room. And the space contained in a stadium. And the space outside, which is limitless, they are all one space. Similarly, consciousness in one body, consciousness is in the second body. Like space, consciousness appears to be many, but ultimately, consciousness is only one. You can't count consciousness as two. Consciousness is indivisible. We see the space as different in different containers. And we see, we know in our mind, intellectually we come to realize that space is one. Similarly, when we look at all the jivas, all the bodies, our intellect mind should understand that there is one consciousness behind all these bodies. It is the same consciousness in the entire universe. Okay, I will stop here. I will start with this uh, slide next week, 349. And uh, in this uh, Bhagavad Gita is quoted, 13th chapter, 2nd verse, 13th chapter, 16th verse, and Shvetashwara Upanishad, chapter 6, the 11th verse. Okay? We are talking about how to see one consciousness in this universe, which is the truth. Okay? All right. It was a very important session today. Uh, we got the gist of the entire Mandukya Upanishad. Simply put, you should know that we are not mortals, we are immortal. Thuriya Atma. Okay. All right. Oh. Oh. Namada.
पूर्णमिदम पूर्णमुदक्षदे पूर्ण से पूर्णमाथाय पूर्णमे वशिष्य शांति 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 ओके प्रीति इज से Bhagavad Gita promotes violence and how paradoxical it is to see for Hindus. I'm sorry, as per the post, as a Vedas to understand the deeper meaning. How do I refuse such views from you? Okay, see, Bhagavad Gita promotes violence is a wrong extract from the Bhagavad Gita teaching. What we are see, it's a wrong understanding. That's all. अहिंसा परो धर्म परो धर्म मीन्स यू डोंट हैव टू किल अदर पीपल बट इन द भगवद गीता वन मस्ट अंडरस्टैंड वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट अबाउट भगवद गीता भगवद गीता इज नॉट डीलिंग विद द व्यावहारिक वर्ल्ड इट इज डीलिंग विद द स्पिरिचुअल एसेंस ऑफ पारमार्थिक सत्य so the answer to your question is don't take bhagavad gita for understanding the vyavahara take it for understanding the paramarthika satya so priti have i answered your question uh, you can unmute yourself i don't see priti here maybe she is not here okay she is here i saw her name uh, yes i couldn't unmute yes shekhar ji i understand your point actually uh, what happened that today i had some kind of debate with some of uh, western crowd and i mean they were quoting how in oppenheimer movie you know he recites the bhagavad gita verses and then uh, as you know in india there is a lot election going on and lot of unnecessary social media post and uh, so many posts circulating referring to bhagavad gita that how we have to defend i mean all that sort of sorts of craziness so i really wanted to like find some some answers to really refute all this kind of uh, uh, craziness going around so yeah that's why okay. i asked so, so i i i hope you have understood my answer yes uh, in a way yes yeah see what you should understand is others will criticize our teachings of bhagavad gita or upanishads but we should know how to face them and say that bhagavad gita is not talking about a vyavaharika world we, we are talking about something which is higher than that which these people are not able to understand you see the problem is all the philosophers this is what is said in brahma sutras all the philo philosophers they have only one reality which is the vyavaharika reality they don't have two realities like how vedanta has vedanta has paramarthika satyam and vyavaharika satyam and pratibhasika satyam so unless and until somebody understands properly what bhagavad gita is saying when you go through the 18 chapters you will get the gist of it if somebody is only looking at one sentence one chapter this is what is the problem with all other philosophers they look at one verse and say that this is what bhagavad gita is talking so you can answer them but they may not accept what you say that is the problem see when we tell the truth that this is what is the truth maybe they may not understand us clearly because they only see it what what is physically is being shown in the media and so on don't get carried away by it. uh as far as you are concerned you are a seeker you are a holder of this uh, uh teaching and move forward good thank you uh rama 
Chandramurti saying uh, Jagra Sushupti is the solution and a wonderful retreat method. Am I right? Yeah, correct. Okay. See, what you have to understand is in the second verse, what Gaudapada Charya is trying to say is he is trying to say that you need not go to the three avastas, Jagrat, Swapna, Sushupti. That is an easier method. If you ask me, that is an easier method than in Jagrat itself to see dream and sleep also. It is slightly difficult because uh, you need a, a little bit of preparation to see your mind in the Jagrat avastha. That is why I am saying it is slightly difficult. But if you are able to see it, all three in the same avastas, then you can see the purpose of this uh, of uh, understanding Mandukya Upanishad is there is a immortal Atma, Thuriya Atma, which I should locate and own it. How to locate that is by dropping the three avastas. Whether you can do it all in the waking state itself or you bring all those three states in the waking state because ultimately all teaching takes place only in the waking state. There is no teaching in the dream state or the sleep state. All the teaching is in the waking state. So in the waking state itself, you are supposed to get moksha. By dropping your identification. You see, the, the beauty of Mandukya Upanishad is Step by step, the Upanishad teaches us how to drop this identification. With the waking, as the waker ego, I drop it. Dream, as a dreamer ego, it is limited. It is not limitless. Atma is limitless. The waker ego, dreamer ego, sleeper ego is limited ego. It is conditioned ego. Conditionless is Atma, which is appearing as these three states, which is appearing as the Jeevatma, it is appearing as the Paramatma, it is a delusion and through knowledge you can get rid of this delusion. Very beautiful analysis in the, we'll, we'll see in the Mandukya Upanishad, just keep your mind open to the teaching. Let the mind absorb and reflect on them. You see, when, uh, whenever you listen to a talk, one or two points you write down for reflection. During the next one week, you, you try to see whether all the three states are going into Atma and coming out from Atma. Take this as an exercise. I am that Atma. Okay? Atma is pure. Atma is Turiyam. From that Turiyam only, this waking is coming, dream is coming, sleep is coming up. Again, it goes back to the same Turiyam. And if I can hold on to that Turiyam as eternal Atma, the Upanishad has given me the blessing of the teaching. That is the beauty of this study. It is a very divine teaching. Uh, anyway, I can go on and on. Uh, Rama, have I answered your question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, one more point. Uh, what I understood, uh, it is important to reflect. So, uh, um, uh, Preeti Devi so was mentioning, right? So uh, the controversies, the various, uh, the Beda Bhava in the world, whatever is prevailing, uh, is out of ignorance only because everyone is Atman only. There is only one consciousness. Right? So the multitude is nothing but out of ignorance only. So either it is, so mostly in the uh, waking state only, uh, all these controversies, comments, comments, about one religion talking about the other religion, ridiculing that, this, all these things. So what I understand is, so from the Atmic uh, perspective, from the consciousness perspective, 
so whenever such a situation arises, uh, so I have to understand that it is out of ignorance only they are talking. But if a situation prevails, I should be able to comment briefly uh, without uh, making any disturbance. So am I right, sir? Yes, you are right. Yeah, very beautiful. What you have said is correct. The teaching, you should be able to apply it in your life. Swami Chinmayanda says very clearly, application of the Vedantic knowledge in real life is the real teaching which you have to do, which you have to absorb the teaching and apply it. Applying it, while applying it, what happens is you have a very strong mind and a str this teaching helps you to have a strong mind. The strength of the mind comes only from the teaching. See, the Turiyam, Atma, suppose you have understood it, then what happens? Everything else in the life is just a, an incidental play. It is a play of Maya Shakti. There is a Shakti. There is a power in this world. That power, each one of us experiences it as the mind. Maya Shakti, if you want to know what is Maya Shakti, if I want to know, it is invisible. Atma Turiyam is also invisible. But this Maya Shakti in the form of the mind, it makes me think that there are that there is a world outside and I am the experiencer of the world. This is for the law of karma. This is this is for the law of prarabdha karma, sanchita karma. That aspect I should understand. That this is a world which is there. Javaharika world is there to fulfill the prarabdha karma, sanchita karma, that law. But there is a higher truth behind this universe which is there is no triputi at all. There is only one Atma. That is what gives you moksha. Knowing that Atma as the Satyam and everything else, whatever I experience as the body, mind, all my experiences is Mithya. Satyam Mithya, if you are able to ultimately understand and hold on, very clearly in your mind you should have the Satyam Mithya differentiation. This is what will give you moksha. This is what is what is called as freedom from sorrow. Any type of sorrow. You see, if sorrow comes in our life, in our Vyabaharika life, sorrow will come. Because in the Vyabahara, we are attached to the physical body, we are attached to the mind, we are attached to our intellect. Sometimes we will feel I am not understanding. Sometimes we will feel I have understood everything. But these are all this is what is called as Maya Shakti. This is the delusionary power of Maya. Good. I'm uh, very happy that you are in the right track, Rama. Thank you. Anybody Thank you, else sir. has a question? Uh, Namaste, Shekharji. Uh, yeah, Ramesh. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, slightly different, but uh, related to the Ekamatma. So I'm trying to understand here. So, uh, if you see the Sanskrit uh, root for Atma, it is Atman. And uh, if the Vibhaktis are Atma, Atmanav, Atmanaha, which means one Atma, two Atmas and multiple Atmas. So that is where is the confusion. Why is that word? It, it should be indeclinable like Abhyaya. So that only has one word Atma. Why is it having so many the Vibhaktis? And it has, a, this is the subject, then the object also is there. So the accusative case, which is used for objects. So, Atma can, cannot be an object, right? So, in that case, why is it even defined that way in okay. Sanskrit? Yeah, you see, what we must understand is the teaching of the Upanishad is one Atma. But the teaching, it will come to you after you have gone through the Upanishadic literature. But all of us are starting from where? We are starting from the Vyavaharika world. In the Vyavahara, suppose you tell you tell somebody without giving the entire background, if you tell him there is only one Atma, he will not understand. You have to start from where you are standing today. That means your eyes are seeing Veda. Your eyes are seeing 
so many jivas, so many bodies, so many, uh, there are so many, uh, one point, I mean, uh, look at the amount of living beings in this world, human beings in this world. What is I reporting? I is reporting Veda. Veda is at the Vyavaharika level. And we all have to start from the Vyavaharika level. Therefore, we accept Atma, Bahutva Atma at the Vyavaharika level. Without that Bahutva, Bahutva Atma, that means we accept what Sankhya is saying, what uh, Vaisheshika is saying. Other philosophers also are talking about there is many, many Atmas. Therefore, your grammar has to follow what Vyavahara is. We are starting in this fashion. Now, after you have gone through Upanishads and you have understood that we are talking of one Atma, not at the Vyavaharika level, but it is at a Paramartika level. See, this is this is a problem with most of the questions which uh, seekers they ask because they don't see the difference between Vyavaharika and pa Paramartika. Paramartika, simple way to understand is what? Waker and dreamer. The dream world, you see so many people, so many jivas, there is interaction. You see a world which is totally different than the waking world. But all of that becomes what? One mind. One mind is the entire dream. What Upanishad says is this entire waking world is also like that when you wake up to Eka Atma. Eka Atma is a concept which comes in only after you have understood Mahavakya. Jivatma, Paramatma, they are only appearances, therefore they are taken as Mithya. So Bahutvam and the plurality of Atma which you see is at the beginner's level, at a junior student level, for the sake of teaching. We all start from the Bahutvam. We all start and say, yes, there is. But then this is at the Adhyaropa level, when you come to Apavada level, that means you negate the plurality as Mithya and that time you say Eka Atma. Is it clear, Ramesh? Yeah, yeah. Good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else has any other questions? Um, I have a question, Hari Omji. Yeah, 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 very side. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, here uh, the thing is like uh, the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita is bhakti, uh, karma, karma, bhakti, and gnana. Okay, yeah. uh, and uh, the thing is to get the gnana, like to get the moksha in this uh, during this janma, uh, some people say that it has to be written in our feet, uh, uh, it has to be written in our fate, then in only you can. Yeah. Yeah, in our fate, then only you can attain moksha. Yeah. But some people, if you see the Purana Hitiha, some people they attain moksha, uh, like based on bhakti mark. So, um, what is the actual thing as per Upanishad, like uh, to attain moksha? How? What are the things to be practiced? Okay, good question. This is a very, uh, which is this is a very uh, common question for all the seekers. Uh, see what we should understand is. Bhagavad Gita is a scripture which is teaching Advaita Vedanta through Jnana Yoga. That is ultimate teaching of Bhagavad Gita and Upanishads and also the teaching of Puranas. See, in the Purana, Bhakti is given more prominence but ultimately, if you study the Puranas also very, very intensely, if you study deeply the Puranas, they also have the same teaching of Brahman, Turiya Atma, and it is also talking about Jnana Yoga. But Puranas are written for the common people who, can, who do not have that 
purity of mind to pick up the essence through jnana yoga to answer your question what the what the teachers what teachers they tell us is bhakti karma yoga are all stepping stones for coming to jnana yoga all types of yogas which you have any type of pilgrimage you take up you take a japa according to the people who teach jnana yoga they say this is what they say the teachers have said i am this is not my teaching this is not this is not any person's teaching and if you follow bhagavad gita properly if you understand the gita very well you can easily see it yourself initially in the first six chapters of the bhagavad gita in the second chapter itself lord krishna gives us the essence of the whole teaching the of bhagavad gita which yeah. is jnana that is the meditation i am going to do in the next uh, 20 weeks one 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 verse per session there are 30 about 20 verses so you will see for sure that jnana is the most important factor for moksha i mean i have studied uh, spirituality for say about 30 years this is what i have learned that jnana yoga is ultimate essence of all the scriptures when you study the higher text especially advanced text like vichara sagara uh, shruti sara samudranam and then you study even when you study the bhashyam you see while you studying the bhashyam itself you will understand this just continue the study of mandukya upanishad you will get this answer <clears throat> so the the simple answer to your question is bhakti is important yeah. karma is important but they are stepping stone to come to jnana yoga which is the 13th chapter 14th chapter 15th chapter of bhagavad gita these three chapters gives you the essence of jnana yoga you just read this three 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 chapters at your own at your own pace you will understand that jnana is important because ultimately suppose you want to remove darkness from a room what will you bring you will bring light you will bring a torch light one small candle can remove the darkness so even so the darkness ignorance which we are living with the spiritual darkness see i don't know who i am i don't know what the world is that is the darkness so if i if this is the ignorance which i have what will what will remove this ignorance only knowledge knowledge about what knowledge about my real nature body is not my real nature that is what gita is saying bhakti will help me to come to this jnana karma yoga will help me to purify the mind but ultimately i have to do shravanam mananam nidityasram all puranas in vichara sagara a very beautiful text which consists of uh, i mean my notes on vichara sagara runs into about 7000 pages you will see it in my website one thing he says in the end of vichara sagara that all spiritual practices which you have done all religious practices which you have done ultimately are useful to come to jnana yoga it purifies the mind your mind itself will ask it will ask the question who am i what is this world about it will never leave you and this doubt this ignorance which is there it can be it can be removed only by atma jnana only atma jnana nothing else that is why people uh, go behind this upanishad they try to find out where i can get this teaching where i can get this teachings many millions of people are uh, dying to come to this knowledge uh, am yeah. i am i clear uh, yes sir 
yeah it's clear sir thank you very much Hari thank you good thank, thank you uh anybody else has a question okay we have uh we have, we have discussed this uh so next week we'll continue the study of mandukya thank you and uh, have a great day all of you <laughs> namaste thank you Hariyo. Hariyo. Yeah. Hariyo. <laughs> Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shikhaji. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Hari Om. Bahu Bhai, kaisa hai ho? Thik hai. Thik hai. Very good. Very good. Nice to see you.